Okay, guys. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, GWAS, genome-wide association studies and disease mapping. And we're also going to start with linkage, which is the traditional way of mapping genetic uh, loci from Mendelian traits. So here we are here in the second lecture of the uh, population genetics and disease genomics uh, part of the class. So uh, next week we're going to be talking about quantitative traits and specifically focusing on expression quantitative trait loci. And then next Thursday we're going to be talking about uh, complex traits uh, at the extreme and, and heritability. So uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, genetics. So uh, you know, first of all, Mendelian traits, genome association studies, then interpreting these loci, and then the next generation of associations. So on Tuesday, we talked about population genetics, and this is the foundation on which we're building. Basically, how does the human population structure um, dictate the genomic properties that we're going to have? at a genetic loci, and how does that allow us to then carry out strategies for discovering? So the basic goal that we're starting with is how can genetic research help meet outstanding medical challenges? And there's challenges at all uh, ranges. On one hand, uh, most therapies have been developed through traditional approaches, but then they fail to have efficacy. You basically first identify a target, uh, through some means, then you do genetic screening, and then you develop animal models, and you go into clinical trials. And this is sort of the traditional pipeline. And what we have found is that uh, a lot of drugs are in fact failing at the very end of this process. And the reason is that they're actually not starting from the best targets. So sure, they can figure out how to modulate whatever target they're interested in, but that target is not coming from genetic studies. And when uh, studies were conducted to basically ask what fraction of studies succeed at the end, if their initial target was based on genetics, they found an almost twofold increase in the rate of success at uh, phase two and phase three clinical trials for efficacy. So what that basically says is that in order to define the best targets, we need to actually have uh, genetic data. That's the, the first mode, basically informing therapeutic development, basically uh, building better targets so that we can then develop better therapies. <clears throat> the second uh, mode that is in everybody's mind is basically personalized genomics. So genetics providing individualized medical insights, providing diagnostics in case of severe genetic disorders, identifying individuals who are more or less likely to benefit from a specific therapeutic intervention, and then predict individuals who are at risk for uh, severe adverse uh, drug effects. And the problem with that is that this has been, again, very heavily oversold for many years. And um, you know, technical advances are bringing what has been a futuristic vision to reality. But you should realize that a lot of GWAS and a lot of common variants that we're talking about have very small effect sites. So the, the second mode is uh, predominantly for rare variants that have Here's the scope of the challenge. We basically have uh, within every cell two copies of the genome, 23 chromosomes, 20,000 20, genes, 3.2 billion letters of DNA, and then millions of polymorphic sites. So, how do you find in this very, very large haystack the needles that are uh, the genetic association? And, um, you know, there are some uh, very common examples. This is one I like to show about my own genome. So, basically, when I carried out 23andMe, I found that my strongest uh, genetic uh, the disposition was for uh, age-related macular degeneration. This is when you lose uh, the central part of your vision as you uh, become older. And uh, I have basically three pathogenic variants that increase my risk, and I have two protective variants that decrease my risk. And this is sort of where they are. These are the you know, corresponding loci that basically lead to my increased risk. So you know, they're sitting here, here, and here, and these are the corresponding loci. So two of them are in fact perturbing proteins. So you can see here that you know, these guys are uh, actually disrupting amino acids. And then the third one is sitting in this uh, non-coding uh, region. So basically there's a lot of differences both in coding and non-coding loci that basically contribute to this disease. So how do we know all this? Well, it all started with Mendel. Basically Mendel carrying out his experiments on the inheritance patterns of phenotypic traits in um, peas. So he basically recognized discrete units of inheritance and that variation in these units 
was transmissible and resulted in phenotypic differences. Then he could study the you know, phenotypic traits of the parents and then ask what will be the phenotypic traits of the offspring. And uh, if he had, for example, um, round and yellow as the traits uh, versus you know, round and green, so basically, you know, yes, yellow, no yellow, and then yes, round, not round, were the two alleles for every locus. And what he basically found was that you know, when you crossed these uh, parental uh, phenotypic uh, characteristics, you ended up with a very specific pattern in the count of the offspring. And then without knowing anything about the basis of inheritance uh, and you know, the molecular basis of how this is carried out, he basically arranged them in a table that could actually explain the offspring in the independent inheritance of individual traits. So, uh, of course, uh, he very famously uh, had to adjust some of the numbers in the third uh, digit, to basically make the numbers match, because he could actually find, uh, he actually found some discrepancies because between what he would have expected from his model of complete independent assortment and what he found. And it turns out that those tiny little discrepancies were the very basis for uh, effectively human genetics and linkage analysis. Then the idea is that some pairs of phenotypes were not passed on independently, violating uh, Mendel's rules of independent assortment. And specifically, the reason for this is that they were on the same chromosome near each other. Therefore, they were linked. So, you know, he could actually uh, find these discrepancies. And when he had expected, you know, 50%, 50%, 0%, 0%, 0%, he found 48.6, you know, and 1.4. So, and in some much more dramatic cases, in places where uh, the two loci were uh, nearly perfectly linked to each other, he would have expected, again, perfect independent assortment, but he found that there was almost complete linkage. So then this was formalized by recognizing that uh, the further you are on the chromosome, the more co-inheritance you would have. The genes on the same chromosome were passed along in tandem uh, you know, units unless, unless there was a crossover event between them. And the genes, which were separated by only three centimorgan, would only have a 3% chance of recombination. You can see here that you know, the kernel collar or you know, the bronze collar and the endosperm and so forth were, in fact, very, very closely related on the same. So then, you know, this is, of course, known as Senti Morgan, uh, based on the advisor, but it turns out that the guy who actually invented it was uh, his student, Alfred Sturtevart, Avant. And then he basically uh, says, he writes, I suddenly realized that the variations in strength of linkage, already attributed by Morgan to differences in the spatial separation of genes, offered the possibility of determining sequences in the linear dimension of the chromosome. I went home and spent most of the night of my undergraduate homework in producing the first chromosome map, which included the sex linked genes, Y, W, V, M, and R, in the order and approximately the same relative spaces that they still appear on the standard maps. So this was kind of like a puzzle. You basically have all these distances to match. How do you line them along on the chromosome? And he basically figured out that this was not just some vaguely proportional uh, uh, property but it was actually a quantitative uh, unit of uh, recombination. And that's sort of what led effectively to uh, Mendelian genetics. So basically, uh, Mendelian diseases would basically travel predictably and consistently in families. If you have, for example, a dominant transmission pattern, everybody that has, um, you know, um, in this particular case, you basically have uh, the blue trait being inherited if you have you know, two copies of the big A allele, and then the red one being inherited if you have uh, one copy of the uh, little A allele, and then the double A's appear to just simply not be viable. Actually, no, they simply just never arise because this parent is heterozygous. So basically, this is a dominant effect that comes from the little A allele, and everybody who has the little A allele, doesn't matter what the other allele looks like, gets 
phenotype. In this particular case, you know, if you inherit, uh, you know, big A, then you're fine. If you inherit little a from, from dad in this particular case, then you are always uh, a case. This is one example of dominant inheritance, where even having uh, one of these uh, copies actually leads to having the disease. There are thousands of diseases that are caused by mutations in a single gene. We saw some example last time, the Huntington disease, cystic fibrosis, uh, muscular dystrophy is another example. Basically, these have been mapped painstakingly by asking, you know, what are common genotypes that I already know about nearby, and then how do they co-segregate with a disease genotype? So then if I start observing the inheritance patterns of, you know, these alleles, then I can just start recognizing that, hey, every time there's a C nearby, I end up getting that disease. So maybe that disease gene is actually sitting near that C nearby. So you can basically track the co-segregation of DNA polymorphisms with the disease statues, and that actually allows you to identify the regions that are responsible for both the genes uh, and uh, that contain the mutations. So this actually led to huge success in the 80s and the 90s, and many, many genes were localized uh, that were you know, previously huge, huge. So then uh, the concept of Mendelian disease genetics was that if you inherited the genotype, that basically almost guaranteed that you were going to be inheriting the disease state. So linkage analysis and positional cloning were basically very powerful because the genetic risk factors were in fact highly penetrant. If you had the genotype, you almost certainly had the disease. With complex traits, things were in fact much more uh, complex. And the reason is that... Um, you know, it, the inheritance patterns were simply not as simple. You couldn't just simply map this trait. If you look at, you know, Mendelian traits, you basically saw this uh, exponential explosion in the number of uh, Mendelian traits for which the molecular base was actually recognized. And if you look at, uh, you know, complex traits, you basically found this very, very sort of slow growth uh, with only, uh, you know, 10 or, uh, you know, just a very small number of these traits as uh, are recognized compared to thousands for Mendelian traits. And the reason for that was uh, that, you know, the, the, the linkage, anal linkage analysis simply did not work for those traits. Basically, the very first trait to be, you know, mapped with a complex uh, inheritance pattern was in fact in Drosophila. Uh, the truncate wing trait was mapped by Mueller back in 1920. And uh, the problem with um, complex traits in you know, human and in most complex organisms is that they are not binary. You don't simply have the disease or don't have the disease. They are arranged according to this uh, you know, Gaussian distribution, this bell curve. In this particular case, you can see uh, human uh, height uh, in a very visual way being arranged you know, along this pattern with very few individuals that are Extremes and most of the individuals being in the middle. So in the early 1900s, basically, you know, this was simply a huge problem. There was a huge discrepancy between Mendelian inheritance that had been very nicely demonstrated by uh, Mendel and others, and then complex traits that were appearing to have this uh, very continuous distribution. And the reason for that was increasingly recognized to be that you basically had you know, many, many genes contributing each to uh, individual subphenotypes, which would then ultimately combine into a disease state, very often modulated by environmental exposures. So if you look at a uh, paper in uh, 1975, uh, King and Wilson basically wrote in Science, which suggests that evolutionary changes in anatomy and way of life are more often based on changes in the mechanisms controlling the expression of genes you know, sequence changes in proteins. We therefore propose that regulatory mutations account for the major biological differences between humans and chimps. And they recognize that humans and chimps are in fact 99% you know, percent identical, and that this 1% that was leading to differences was not necessarily you know, new genes that humans had that chimps didn't have. It was simply how we were using those common genes. And the same thing ended up being true in uh, disease, basically differences in disease not because you had a different gene, but because we had differences in those genes. 
And this was formalized remarkably 100 years ago by R.A. Fisher in a seminal paper that he wrote in 1918, where he basically explained the correlation between our relatives on the supposition of Mendelian inheritance, which basically says that many Mendelian traits the inheritance of many, many genes, each of which is inherited in Mendelian fashion, and then lead to a distribution that is 